With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, contingency plans for wildfire smoke exposure, and the USDA is providing $400 million to support water management in the West. But to start today, Canadian cattle producers are concerned about proposed trade policies after the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Dennis Guy reports. The Canadian Cattle Association says that while the U.S. presidential election is less than three months away, the organization will continue to reinforce with American legislatures at state and federal levels the reality of how important cross-border trade is to the economy of both the U.S. and to Canada. The USMCA Trade Pact Review is coming up for its initial review in July of 2026. Nathan Finney, a cattleman based in New Brunswick, says that his organization is working to stay well ahead of that agreement review. Finney, who is also president of the Canadian Cattle Association, says that exporters of all products, including his organization, has faced strong headwinds from Republican and Democrat trade policies in recent times. Former President Trump, running under the Republican banner, has been promoting an across-the-board 10% import tariff. And the current Democrat administration is pushing a Made in America agenda. But Nathan Finney says that his organization, in tandem with Canadian trade officials, will continue to be relentless in their ongoing mission to keep products moving smoothly across the border. Had the Democrats some of their trade policy of putting in a voluntary product to U.S. And we've heard Trump's platform of tariff rates catastrophic, to be quite frank. So we're going to really focus on that to ensure that the points are well positioned why we have the world's largest integrated live cattle system. We're tasked to feed the world and be an economic driver, which we are. We need to continue to ensure that we don't have barriers in place. And while the American presidential election is taking center stage right now, Canadian export-oriented organizations believe that the needs of individual states and their legislative representatives will provide the underlying strength and impetus for ongoing international trade movement. Nathan Finney says the Canadian Cattle Association sees their primary thrust over the next two years to have ongoing discussion with legislators at both the state and federal levels in preparation for the USMCA review in the summer of 2026. It's very valuable to get ahead of this. When we get into these negotiations, the goal is to ensure that beef remains able to move back and forth without any political interference. I think we need to continue to work on our relationship building with all different groups and parties, whether it be governing states, senators, members of Congress, and make sure that these relationships are fundamentally sound. 70% of our trade is with the U.S. Reporting from Canada, I'm Dennis Guy. Low prices are bringing the ag export revenues down. Gary Crawford has more. We now have the complete U.S. ag trade numbers for the first nine months of this fiscal year, October through June, and the central theme running through it all. The continued cooling of U.S. export values, uh, which is really tied to the bulk commodities. USDA economist Bart Kenner, his latest trade update has overall ag export values down from a year ago by only 4%. But if you just look at the major bulk commodities, and those account for about a third of all ag exports, those export values are down 17% from the previous year. Export values for wheat, corn, soybeans, cotton, all down. But Kenner says it's not because crops are not being sold and shipped. For example, in terms of export volume. Corn, which we said was down 6% by value, is actually up 29% by volume. Kenner says it's these low prices doing the damage. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now available, USDA's latest look at farm production expenditures in total and by various categories. Here's Rod Bain. It might surprise some how much ag producers pay for expenses. 
Case in point, in 2023, U.S. farms, and this excludes Alaska and Hawaii, spent almost a half a trillion dollars on expenses necessary to run their farms and ranches. Farm expenditures were $481.9 billion in 2023. And according to USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service Administrator Joseph Parsons, that's up 6.5% from 2022. Other highlighted data points from USDA's latest annual look at farm production expenditures for the four major expense categories categories, feed, livestock and poultry, farm services and labor. Each of those are really substantial and make up about half of total expenditures. The report also looked at expenditures by commodity, farm size, region and state for last year. Parson adds the Economic Research Service will publish its latest farm income estimates on September 5th. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. In today's National Spotlight, earlier this summer, John Deere said it was laying off more than 600 employees at production plants in Illinois and Iowa. The company also said it was moving some of its jobs from the U.S. to Mexico. C.J. Miller reports on how one congressman is quite upset with John Deere's recent decisions. You know, I'll tell you, I'm really frustrated today. I don't believe that Deere and company is being forthcoming about their plans for the future. And that's Illinois Congressman Eric Sorensen, who represents the district where John Deere's corporate headquarters are located. In spite of the layoffs, Sorensen points to the fact that John Deere generated more than $10 billion in profits in 2023, while the company's CEO, John May, received more than $26 million in total compensation last year alone. I mean, there are challenges in the ag economy, but John Deere has been effective in making a profit for its shareholders. Um, So looking forward, we have to understand um, that it is a profitable company. That's the thing that's concerning for me because I don't believe that we're at the end of the the Deere and Company's layoff period. Sorensen says he's also concerned that if John Deere were to move more of its manufacturing to Mexico and overseas, they could have a crippling effect on the U.S. ag economy. We would need to know where is the future of Deere and Company. And we need to know that the future of agriculture in our country has a an American-made John Deere being a part of that. I'm C.J. Miller. Farming is a stressful occupation and pressures are mounting for those in agriculture. Chad Smith has more on one resource farmers and ranchers can turn to. Farming is a challenging occupation associated with increased levels of anxiety, depression, and even suicide. Jessica Cabrera, Managing Director of Member Engagement for the American Farm Bureau Federation, says AFBF has resources to help. Farm State of Mind is American Farm Bureau's mental well-being campaign. We work to increase awareness and reduce stigma regarding mental health challenges for farmers and ranchers, and we also work work to increase access to information, resources, and training for farm and ranch communities across the United States. Cabrera says Farm State of Mind has a variety of tools in the toolbox. We have a national resource directory, helpful tips and videos. There's a peer-to-peer support network with access to free counseling and consultation services. We offer research. There's a free on-demand rural resilience training and lots of resources for help with opioid misuse. She says it's incredibly important to get past the stigma of mental health challenges and be open about the struggles. Farming is a very demanding profession, and there are many, many unique stressors for farmers and ranchers across this country. And unfortunately, suicide rates are two to five times higher than the average rate. This is something that we have to stop. Farmers and ranchers and farm communities need to believe believe and understand that reaching out for help is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. And having a healthy farm is nothing if there's not a healthy you. For more information, go to fb.org forward slash farm state of mind. Chad Smith, Washington. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's John Harris with the Livestock Report. While beef export volume was down slightly in June, exports of U.S. beef hit the highest value in nearly two years. U.S. Meat Export Federation President and CEO Dan Hallstrom has the details. We're $938 million exported in the month of June, which is up 3% off of a pretty big number from a year ago. I look at individual countries and uh, one that stands out that's really welcome to see now two months in a row is Japan. 
Uh, Japan was up 8% on, on volume and up 9% on value, $182 million a month. And considering all the headwinds that Japan has had the last year or so, it's really encouraging to see uh, see this rebound. And uh, specifically, I have to think that some of this rebound is coming from the food service sector. So, so Japan is one highlight. I think another one is, uh, while it was down a little bit, it was off a relatively high number, it was Mexico. Uh, as you know, year-to-date, Mexico is up 13%. Uh, on volume, 19% on value. So Mexico uh, for the year uh, through six months, two quarters is is looking pretty strong. We saw significant growth in the value for exports per head slaughtered, uh, $459 per head in June, uh, up over $50 a head compared to a year ago. June pork exports were lower year over year, but shipments for the first half of the year remained ahead of 2023's record value pace. And key market Korea posted a big month. Korea continues to perform on the pork side, 20% growth year on year for the month of June on volume, 30% growth on value, and the year-to-date numbers through six months. At 135,000 tons, 33% growth through June, and, and uh, on the value side, 38% growth at $460 million. So Korea, without a doubt, uh, is really uh, one of the markets, in addition to Mexico, that's really driving the ship so far this year. For more, please visit USMEF.org for the U.S. Meat Export Federation. I'm John Harris. Lower topsoil moisture ratings now reflecting seasonal highs. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says U.S. topsoil moisture rated very short to short for the period ending August 4th. Currently, short to very short ratings, 35 percent. That is up three points from last week, and that actually represents the highest number that we have seen this year so far. And it's the highest number for topsoil moisture rated very short to short since the final week of the 2023 season. Drier conditions in the West and Central U.S are behind the deteriorating topsoil moisture conditions on a countrywide level. The wet side, well, at least until this week, not a whole lot of wetness to talk about. Surplus numbers at 7% nationally. That is likely to change in states like Georgia and the Carolinas, but that's news for next week. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Don't forget if you've missed any of our morning shows or if you simply need to catch the news at a different time, you can subscribe to our podcast and have statewide agriculture news at your convenience. All you have to do is search for the Agnet News Hour on your favorite podcast downloading app. That's Agnet News Hour and it's available wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with a preview of what you'll hear today on Agnet West, here's Brian German. Ag employers have several exposure considerations for wildfire smoke. President and CEO of AgSafe, Teresa Keene, references potential avenues for complying with smoke exposure regulations. If the AQI is high in the area that you're working, is there an opportunity to move your employees to another field? Do you stop work earlier and see what tomorrow looks like? I know that you've got such production demands, so it's hard to pivot, but if there's an opportunity to pivot and to move your crew to a place where the AQI is less, how to do that and so can you again in your shift early so those are all things to think about and to ensure that you pay attention to so Kalusha has some FAQs some fact sheets that you can go take a look at and some additional information so utilize that as a resource container shipping appears to be experiencing some notable changes According to the shipping and maritime news portal container news US ports are facing a mix of challenges and shifting dynamics On the West Coast, shipping rates from Asia have been dropping due to fears of a potential U.S. recession, which could reduce demand for imports. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, labor strikes by dock workers are creating uncertainties. These strikes, along with the upcoming U.S. election, are causing some importers to worry about further disruptions. Because of these issues, some companies are looking for alternatives to U.S. ports, and Mexico is becoming a popular option. Mexican ports have shown they can handle increased demand with a 30% rise in shipping volumes from China over the past year. By routing some of their shipments through Mexico, companies are trying to avoid the risks associated with U.S. port disruptions, higher tariffs, and potential delays. I'm Brian German for AgNet West Radio Network.
The U.S. Department of Agriculture has announced an investment of $400 million to help support at least 18 irrigation districts in the West. Districts across various states, including Idaho, Oregon, Arizona, and California, have been provisionally selected for a USDA program that may award up to $15 million each. These districts will work with producers to voluntarily reduce water consumption while maintaining commodity production. Producers will receive payments and adopt various water conservation strategies like irrigation improvements and management shifts. USDA will finalize agreements with these districts detailing specific water saving strategies, commodities, and budgets. The overall initiative is expected to save 50,000 acre feet of water across 250,000 acres of irrigated land and expand sustainable market opportunities. Figures from the U.S. Department of Agriculture show that California contributed the most to overall American farm expenditures last year. USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service reports that farm production expenditures in the United States are estimated at nearly $482 billion for 2023. That marks a 6.5% increase from the year prior. Livestock, poultry, and related expenses, feed, farm services, and labor make up nearly half of the national total of farm expenditures. California contributed most to total expenditures in 2023 with expenses of $52.7 billion, making up nearly 11 percent of total U.S. farm expenditures. California figures increased significantly more than the national average, increasing 14.9 percent from the 2022 estimate of nearly $46 billion. The Lynn Cove Research and Extension Center will be hosting several citrus extension meetings in the coming months. The Association of Applied IPM Ecologists has organized a citrus roundtable to take place on August 20th. It will be an opportunity for citrus pest control advisors to get together and talk about how they manage pests. The roundtable will highlight topics including ant control, ACP, weed management, thrips, red scale, current regulations, mealybug, and other pest management problems PCAs have been running into. A citricola scale field day is also scheduled to take place at Lynn Cove on September 24th. The two-hour event will focus on teaching PCAs on pest identification, monitoring, and best practices for monitoring citricola scale, which has been a significant problem for growers this year. More information about the meetings is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. A breakdown of farm production expenditures. That's coming up on this line of hours. USDA's latest look at farm production expenditures in total and by various categories gives insight into the economics of farming around the nation. USDA NASS Administrator Joseph Parsons says California leads in expenses. We do tabulate these data by region and also for the largest producing states, we also produce some state level statistics. In the Midwest region, think Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, that region accounts for 31% of U.S. total production expenditures with just over $150 billion, and that's up 4.6% from 2022. As far as states go, the largest state expenditure is in California, and they contributed the most to the 2023 total at $52.7 billion. And it should be said that the California production expenditures are up nearly 15% from 2022. Iowa, which is the next largest state in terms of farm production expenditures, had almost $38 billion in farm production expenses. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. An expert says, take care of your brain. It's the only one you've got. Today on this edition of Agriculture USA, Gary Crawford has expert advice on how to boost your brain. Yes, the median age of the U.S. population is increasing year by year by year. Back in 2011, the median age was 37 years of age. Today, at last count, it's up to a tad below 39 years. Also, what's the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population? It's the 85 and older group. And, of course, unfortunately, we know that as we get older, our ability to process and, and think is going to be a little bit diminished over, over time. But stick with us here. We might have some ways to help with that problem. On this edition of Agriculture USA, I'm Gary Crawford. Yes, age has a way of messing with our bodies, but also our minds. But there are a lot of things we can do to delay that as long as possible. 
That's Sherilyn Jackson. She's an Extension Health Educator, Kansas State University. Here's an important fact to know about her. I support the pickleball movement completely. Uh, okay, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> But actually, this does come into play a little later in our story. Now, back to the issue of brain health. Sherilyn says it is true. Genetics and our family histories can play a role in things like Alzheimer's and dementia. But lifestyle is much a much bigger contributor to these factors. And she says no matter how young or how old you are, the more physical activity in your lifestyle, the better off your brain's going to be. Studies confirm that over and over again. And Sherilyn says you don't have to be a runner or an athlete for physical activity to boost your brain. What you really have to think about is getting movement throughout your day, getting up and moving, if you can, even every 30 minutes. If you have a job where you sit a lot, at least stand, you know, shake your arms and legs a little bit, move your body. But if you can move throughout your day, that's, that's the place to start. And she says it does wonders for the brain. It helps improve the blood flow to the brain. That's really a key thing. It helps imp- reduce inflammation. It helps to improve your cognitive health, meaning you can help you know, think more clearly, problem solve. Research has shown that exercise of any type also reduces production of stress-related hormones in the body, and it helps us sleep better. That, again, plays into cognitive health. Yes, let's uh, stop right there. Sherilyn says getting enough sleep, super important for good brain and body health and performance. Just in a nutshell, it's important for your heart and your other organs to function, and it allows the brain and your body to slow down and engage in that process of recovery and renewal. And that's what sleep does for us. It helps that recovery and renewal. And when you're under a lot of stress, also sleep is is really important during those times. Unfortunately, doctors say most Americans don't get anywhere near the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep a night. So let's get back to exercise, though. We heard that exercising the body is good for the brain, but exercising the brain also very important. Learning new things, particularly as you age. And that brings us back around to... I really love the pickleball interest right now because activities like tennis and pickleball are things that not only help you move, get the movement, but your brain is engaged because of the strategy component that's involved with those activities. Now, if you are a bit too old for a pickleball, as I am, Sherilyn says there are all kinds of ways to exercise the brain. There are puzzles to do, classes to attend, and... Even something as simple as when you go to work or to the grocery store, take a different route. Just change it up to where it's not the exact same thing every time. Finally, Sherilyn says a good, healthy diet, heavy on leafy green veggies, light on fat, has been shown to at least stave off things like Alzheimer's and dementia. Also, Sherilyn is not among the folks who are recommending cutting out red meat from the diet. But think about it in smaller portions, using it as a way to flavor your meals instead of being the real focus of it. So we've gone from having a steak that maybe covers half your plate So maybe you have a a bowl with some grains, maybe some quinoa at the bottom, and you top it with a few slices of steak, maybe a few chickpeas or black beans, and then add lots of veggies and such to it. Something like that where it gives the flavor, but it's not the star of the meal. So those are Sherilyn Jackson's recommendations for a better, healthier body and brain. Now, does listening to Agriculture USA on this station help your brain? Science is still working on that one. This is Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington. This segment is brought to you by Live Earth Products. To get to know a little more about Live Earth Products, we're talking on the phone today with Vice President Russell Taylor. Let's talk about LEP. What are the key benefits of your products for farmers in the western zone? So Live Earth Products, we mine and manufacture a ingredient called humate. Now humate is rich in organic acids called humic acid and fulvic acid. Now, those are common components in your soil organic matter. And here in the western United States, unlike, you know, those places around the Mississippi going east, actually have very low organic matter. Now, your organic matter is key in, think of it as the pantry in the soil. So it's key to water retention, nutrient retention, nutrient cycling, microbial activity, those kind of things. 
So anything that's going to impact the increase in soil organic matter will also impact things like water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity, which is a big deal here in the West when water is, is not as abundant as it is in the east side of the United States. Now, what about nitrate? I know nitrate can be a problem in some soils. So how do LEP products help reduce the nitrate problem on saturated soils? So live earth products, it's not unique in the how we um, affect nitrogen, but any organic matter will help retain nitrogen. So typically, the mechanisms that we use are blending the nitrogen with the humate. So what happens is the nitrogen will attach to the humic acid, and you will see less of the processes that degrade or, or volatilize uh, nitrogen. So nitrogen will either convert to a gas or it'll be uh, converted by microbes into a nitrate and leach to the soil. So the longer you have that, that product is not being volatilized or converted, the longer opportunity for that nutrient to be used by the plant. We have university testing that has shown that when you blend these organic acids with the nutrient, you give that plant a longer opportunity to use that nutrient before it's lost, volatilized, or converted. To get to know more about Live Earth products, you can visit them online at liveearth.com. That is spelled L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. This is the Agnet News Hour. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Acnet News Hour. Here is Jesse Harding Campbell with today's featured interview. Animal activists and lab grown meat was a topic of conversation from the Nebraska Governor's Ag and Economic Development Summit. For Agnet West, I am Jesse Harding Campbell. Speaking on these topics was Jack Hubbard. He is executive director for the Center of Environment and Welfare. Jack, as we get going here, explain to us a little bit about what you discussed with the attendees at the summit. Sure. Uh, Specifically, I came and talked about some of the various and evolving threats to animal agriculture and agriculture as a whole, which clearly has an impact on Nebraska. Specifically, we kicked off the presentation talking about the two largest animal rights groups in the United States, the ASPCA and the Humane Society of the United States that collectively raise over $500 million a year from the public. Uh, Most of the public believes that these groups are operating local pet shelters when in fact they're not. The Humane Society of the United States are on zero and the ASPCA has an adoption center in Manhattan. And what's unfortunate is that these groups raise a ton of money using images of cats and dogs but then use a portion of that money to attack agriculture. And they do that through uh, litigation, legislation, attacking it in the public sphere And one of the things I wanted to do is make sure that this audience was aware that these two organizations do not operate animal shelters in the way that much of the public thinks, and only 2% of their budgets actually go to pet shelters as financial grants. So that was number one. And number two, I also wanted to make sure we educated the the group and the leaders of Nebraska here about lab-grown meat, which was approved for sale in the United States about a year ago by the FDA. And what this new technology could mean for agriculture states and what some states are doing to take action to make sure that consumers have transparency about how this stuff is made, what's in it, so that they can make up their own minds. How has policies changed over the years in regards to animal activists or new and upcoming for lab-grown meat? You know, that, that's a big question. What I can tell you is that the anti-agriculture movement has gotten more aggressive. They raise a heck of a lot of money a year. Uh, we're seeing more and more animal rights groups, environmental groups, and even some labor groups align to attack the industry on various fronts. And, and that's a real shame because when you look at U.S. agriculture, we truly are the envy of the world. And you know, we have one of the most affordable, abundant, and safe, you know, food supply chains in the world. Other countries strive to be more like us, and there's a group of people that sit around trying to figure out how to disrupt and destroy what's a modern miracle, which is, you know, U.S. agriculture. And I think producers need to be educated on who the players are that are attacking the industry, uh, how much money they have, their tactics, and only then can you come up with a plan how to fight back and defend the family farm and defend U.S. agriculture, which I think is worthy of defending. We've seen bills like Prop 12 in California, some on the East Coast as well, but you mentioned states are proactively taking action on lab-grown meat. Can you explain that? 
Yeah, so different states have taken different approaches. So Florida and Alabama have outright banned it. And, you know, I think it's of note that after Governor DeSantis banned lab-grown meat in the state, uh, Senator Fetterman, who really doesn't align politically at all with Ron DeSantis, came out and applauded him and said that this is the one thing, you know, the two of them would agree on, that we shouldn't be, you know, feeding people lab-grown meat and feeding kids lab-grown meat. So this truly is a bipartisan issue. Um, it, it tends to get the attention of both Republicans and Democrats, especially people from agriculture states. We've seen other states take action for clear labeling laws. If and when this ends up being served in a grocery store uh, or offered in a grocery store, ensuring that it's properly labeled, the lab-grown industry wants it to be labeled as cultivated, which pulls better with consumers and I think is inherently confusing, whereas uh, we and other groups believe that lab-grown meat is, you know, the real literal definition that ought to be on packages. So there's a fight going on in many state houses about what you call this stuff and, and how you label it. And frankly, the language we use and adopt around this new novel sector will probably uh, dictate its success or lack thereof with consumers. During your presentation, you mentioned it's not just a livestock issue. Why is that? Yeah, I mean, when you look at feed, I you know, the, the percentage of corn that ends up being used to feed livestock and animals is, is a very, very large percentage. So if you're growing row crops, or you're growing corn, uh, I wouldn't make the mistake of thinking that, you know, the broader adoption of lab-grown meat won't impact you because it will. Less animals being raised for food, if the animal rights groups are successful or if lab-grown meat significantly disrupts animal agriculture, is going to have an impact downstream on just about everybody, uh, especially the people that are growing feed for the animals. Is there anything else we might have missed that you'd like to share with listeners? No, no. The only thing I'd say is, you know, American farmers should be proud. They need to be loud and they need to be out there telling their story and calling out misinformation and calling out bad groups. And I, that tends not to be the DNA of a lot of family farmers, but it's going to be necessary because there's some folks that have some very hostile opinions and, a, and an agenda that is designed to attack animal agriculture, and I think folks need to fight back and be more vocal about it. And that was Jack Hubbard. He's executive director for the Center of Environment and Welfare. For Agnet West, I'm Jesse Harding Campbell. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. Now for more news. USDA says they're making changes to their loan programs through its Farm Service Agency to help farmers access credit more easily. C.J. Miller has more. This really signals a new day in ag finance where FSA is going to position itself as the leader and the example for how our friends in the lending community might consider doing this. And that's Zach Ducheneau, administrator for USDA's Farm Service Agency. He says the three big changes that they're making to their loan programs are providing more flexible repayment terms, adding more flexible servicing options, and lowering their collateral requirements. So with this rule, we're announcing that not more than 125% security will be taken in any loans that we make. USDA's collateral requirement was previously as much as 150% of the loan amount. They're also removing the requirement that those who borrow pledge their primary residence as additional collateral. In some of our visits around the country, that's been the biggest stressor. Many of them can process, you know, man, I took a run at it. Things just didn't work out. I'm not going to be able to be in ag production. Boy, I sure hate that I have to lose grandma's house. We're taking that off the table with this rule. Really a fundamental change to the way we do business. The FSA's new changes to their farm loan program begin September 25th. I'm C.J. Miller. The USDA announced $145 million is available through REAP. Chad Smith reports on what the funds are for. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is announcing $145 million in funding for 700 loan and grant awards through the Rural Energy for America program, or REAP, to help agricultural producers and rural small business owners make energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy investments to reduce energy costs, generate new income, and strengthen the resiliency of their operations. Energy technologies eligible for the loan and grant 
grant awards include wind, renewable biomass, ocean, geothermal, hydroelectric, green hydrogen, and solar. What exactly are solar energy projects? Andy Walker, a senior research fellow at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, explains. The scope of the REAP funding in terms of technologies is actually very broad and would include solar photovoltaics, which convert sunlight directly into electricity, or solar thermal, which can deliver heat for, say, hot water or agricultural processes. Photovoltaics are glass modules, each one producing electric current and voltage. Those are wired together in series to get a system voltage of up to 600 volts. And then those series strings are wired in parallel to produce an array of any amount of power. Batteries are included in the scope of the REAP funding. So a photovoltaic system that included batteries to store solar charge for when it's needed would also be eligible. But batteries are expensive. So a lot of times it's just the PV modules and then an inverter to convert the direct current from the PV modules into alternating current that's compatible with the utility system. And then other components might include a transformer and a production meter. But neither the photovoltaic modules or the inverter require regular maintenance in the same way other generators would, but they do require monitoring and maintenance as components might fail. He talks about what types of locations or businesses would be best for a solar project. The solar resource occurs every day and it kind of trickles in. So loads that are not too peaky, loads that are smooth throughout the day, have an ability to use the solar power directly versus a load that's only turned on for a couple hours a week or something like that. Loads that are constant pretty much over the daylight hours and seven days a week are probably the best loads. Facilities where the price of energy is high, of course, have a shorter payback for solar technology. Places where the grid is sufficient to support a solar system under a net metering policy. A lot of times if we want to produce extra power during the day to get a credit under a net metering policy, the electric service to the facility might have to be big enough. An example of that might be if there's a small power line to something like a stock well, it might be hard for that small power line to export enough solar power during the day around noon to offset 24 hours of consumption. Sufficient land area is another criteria. So a nice load that's nice and smooth throughout the day, high utility rates, sufficient electrical service, and sufficient roof or land area to locate the PV array. Those might be like the four most important things to look for. Walker talks about how applicants can ensure their proposal is ready for REAP application reviewers. One of the more common mistakes that we find is that the cost is underestimated, especially in rural areas. Benchmarks cost might not be accurate, so it's probably a good idea to do some investigation, to talk to some local suppliers and make sure that your cost estimate is sufficient. One of the things that's often over overlooked is charges that the utility might charge to hang a new production meter there or two-way bidirectional net meter, or they might have to upgrade the electrical service on their side, such as reconfiguring the circuit breakers to anticipate this reverse power flow from the solar system and maybe to revise the settings on their voltage regulation system. So the utility will have some costs that might have to be incurred by the project, so it makes sense to talk to the utility about costs that they might impose as well. And then finally, don't forget about operation and maintenance in your overall financial prospectus. Agricultural producers and rural small business owners who want to learn more about renewable energy concepts can visit the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's Energy Basics page at nrel.gov forward slash research forward slash learning. Anyone interested in applying for USDA's REAP funding is encouraged to contact their local USDA state energy coordinators for more information. Interested applicants can also visit rd.usda.gov. Enter Rural Energy for America or REAP in the search box. The remaining application window in 2024 ends on September 30th. Reporting for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. I'm Chad Smith. That's today's top agriculture news. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.